All right, anti-inflammatories. You're going to use a lot of these. Um, antibiotics, probably number one, and anthelmintics, close by. Steroids are up there. You'll probably use more of these than you will steroids, though. All right. Now, notice I said anti-inflammatories other than steroids. When you're talking about just controlling inflammation, steroids, glucocorticoids are still our gold standard. Uh, they control pure inflammation better than anything else we have. Okay. <clears throat> but we use these others, and what you're going to see is it's not always, although they're anti-inflammatories, it's not always their major use. A lot of these I'm going to talk about are used for other things, including pain, such as in osteoarthritis, and allergies to control pruritus. So an overall arching mechanism is anti-inflammatory, and I'll address that. But we use them for things other than pure anti-inflammatory aspects. OK, so um, this is my own little creation uh, of where different drugs work, OK? And uh, a double red line means where we can intervene, and then in green we have the drug that acts at that site. Now you say there's nothing there. That's because we don't use mast cell degranulators inhibitions in veterinary medicine. Okay, that's why there's no drug by mast cell degranulation. <coughs> this will be on your test. Okay, hint, hint. All right, so know this chart. Now I'll talk about each of these agents as I go through, but let me kind of take you through an overall uh, scenario. So all of this starts with injury to the cell membrane, okay? So something has injured the cell membrane, trauma, chemical, antigenic, and allergic reaction. Whatever the cause, it's been disrupted. One of the first things in early inflammation is we get mast cell degranulation. All right, and mast cells have histamine and heparin. All right, now we can see some heparin effects, a little bit more bleeding, but mostly, especially in mast cell tumors, but mostly we see histamine release. All right, so that's going to bind to your H1 receptor, your histamine 1, not hydrogen, histamine 1, okay? <laughs> and antihistamines block that, all right? So whereas histamine would normally bind and cause inflammation, we can block it with an antihistamine. All right, <laughs> now, uh, your cell membrane is rich in phospholipids. Remember the lipid bilayer, all right? And these lipids, mainly omega-6 lipids, phospholipids, uh, <coughs> enter what's called arachidonic acid cascade. So phospholipase takes the phospholipid and converts it to arachidonic acid. All right. Now, <coughs> I said these were mostly omega-6s. One of the things we can do is give omega-3 supplements to try to change the composition of the cell membrane. Omega-3s don't enter the arachidonic acid cascade. <coughs> now, steroids, I said, were probably our best anti-inflammatory. They do affect gene expression, they inhibit cyclooxygenase 2 gene expression, but their major effect, you'll recall from last semester, is they inhibit phospholipase. More correctly, they produce a protein that inhibits phospholipase. Blocking this so early is probably part of the reason that we see such profound anti-inflammatory effects. This is probably why steroids are so good as anti-inflammatories. Now, the arachidonic acid can come in and a lot of pathways can occur, okay? It's largely going to be acted on by one of two enzymes, all right? A big one is cyclooxygenase. Cyclooxygenase 
converts arachidonic acid into the prostaglandins. And these are the, and here I'm talking about um, particularly you know, the pro-inflammatory prostaglandins in this diagram. Now prostacycline and thromboxane could arguably be called prostaglandins. They were discovered earlier and we talk about them in specialized roles. Thromboxane is um, pro-platelet aggregation, pro-coagulatory, all right, and prostacycline is anti-platelet anti um, aggregation, anti-coagulation. So these two kind of oppose each other. Thromboxane is important in the platelet. Prostacycline comes from the endothelial lining of the blood vessel. But they're all kind of prostaglandins. Now there are different ways that these can cause inflammation. <laughs> and if we can use NSAIDs, which are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, you'd think by the name that would be everything I'm talking about, but an NSAID specifically inhibits cyclooxygenase. Okay. Now, part of the way we know now that uh, the inflammatory prostaglandins, particularly prostaglandin E, has receptors. Uh, and grapagrin is a drug, you don't know it yet because it hasn't been released. It's due to be released in December. Uh, it blocks the EP4 receptor, so it prevents prostaglandin E from binding to its receptor. So we get blockade here, either through the NSAIDs or now with uh, grapiprint, uh, the EP4 receptor. Now, the other thing that can happen, lipoxygenase can convert arachidonic acid into the leukotrienes. A specific type of uh, leukotriene is 5-HETA. Uh, which is involved in, in some allergic uh, reactions. Now these can be directly pro-inflammatory, but one of the things that they do is they're chemotactic. This, the leukotrienes are part of what pull white cells into the injured area. All right. And so that white cell influx is there to clean things up. All right. We don't want all these injured cell membranes, these dying cells, so they're there to clean it up. But sometimes we get too many white cells, particularly the, the uh, uh, mononuclear cells uh, can either die themselves or produce cytokines that are going to worsen the inflammation. Now, if they die, what's in a neutrophil? Lysosomes. And lysosomes, what's in lysosomes? Free radicals. This is how a neutrophil kills a bacteria. It releases all these damaging free radicals. The superoxide radical, the peroxide radical. Well, if those get <coughs> released, they can kill tissue too. So DMSO, uh, scavenges these free radicals so they don't interact with uh, the tissue to worsen inflammation. Uh, also, we get proteases being released and GAGs, glycosamine glycans, cosequin, dasequin, adequan, may inhibit the proteases. Now notice this is in kind of a orangish, off yellow, not green, that's because this inhibition of protease is not firm, all right? It's one of the ways that it may help, yes? So this is kind of random, but do you know why DMSO causes you to have like garlic taste in your mouth? Yes, why does DMSO make you have a garlic taste in your mouth? Garlic, raw oysters, there are various um, descriptions of it. The DMSO itself doesn't do that, but it's converted to dimethyl sulfone, as I recall, which is volatile. So it goes out the lung, and it's, that's the nasty thing. You, you, you taste and you smell when you use DMSO. Um, and I'll talk about that later. Now, uh, another thing is the, the interleukins are being released, and this is kind of a, a newer specialized pathway. This whole thing was not here maybe three years ago when I gave this lecture. Um, CADI is canine allergic dermatitis immunotherapy. It's a monoclonal antibody that uh, inhibits uh, specific interleukin. And I, 
Plactinib, uh, you know, is Apoquel, is a Janus, Janus kinase inhibitor that stops the cascade that the interleukin started. All right. So now you see we can intervene a whole variety of ways to control inflammation. And everything in green, well, truthfully, every drug I've listed, you will use. Okay. So let me take you through each of these more on a drug by drug basis. Yes, question. What did you say canine? It's in the notes, but it's canine adipy, uh, canine allergic dermatitis immunotherapy, I believe. It's, but the, the note says later on. All right. So uh, I had a double line through mast cells, but I didn't list a drug because we don't use these in vet med. If you take Patidae or a variety of ophthalmics uh, for allergic conjunctivitis, asthma has some mast cell stabilizers. So these do exist mostly for topical or inhaled use. So ophthalmic or inhaled for uh, allergies or asthma, still out there. Theophylline is an old bronchodilator we use. It may inhibit mast cells. And some people argue that if we see a, a fairly rapid benefit from a steroid, it's probably through membrane stabilization. So maybe they have their effect. Remember, steroids, though, typically take several hours, at least for their maximum effect. But a more immediate effect may be through stabilization. All right. But we largely don't use mast cell sta stabilizers. Now, antihistamines are kind of interesting. As I said, they're histamine 1 receptor antagonists. There are histamine 2 receptors in the gastric um, mucosa that secrete acid. We'll talk about those when we talk about the GI drugs. Okay. Now, um, if you went back to the old textbooks in the 60s and uh, 70s, you would find antihistamines listed in nearly every treatment, all right? Pneumonia, peritonitis, arthritis. The idea was if it ended in itis, it had to be inflammation, therefore antihistamines would help it. No, okay, that didn't work out so well. Uh, antihistamines really are only involved in the first few hours of an acute injury, okay? After that, with the exception of allergies, they play a minor role. Now, there's t really a biphasic release in the first 24 hours. There's an immediate and then a few hours later. But <clears throat> mostly, we only use antihistamines for allergies now. All right. Uh, so uh, treatment and prevention of vaccine reactions is uh, really one of the most common. You have a dog that you know is allergic to a vaccine, but you have to give it or he's reacted before. So we'll pre-treat with antihistamines, okay? And we use them a lot in canine atopy, atopy being allergic inhalant dermatitis, all right? So where we have... We have atopy, but it's hay fever for us. When we are exposed to allergens we're allergic to, we get the stuffy nose and runny eyes. Dogs get itchy skin, okay? So we use it there. How effective it is is somewhat debatable. Allergic reactions, yes. Um, acute allergic type one hypersensitivities. Dermatitis, ew, okay, maybe. We use them. Uh, so I always try to give you a prototype and diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl, is your prototype for the uh, antihistamines, all right? And it's the main one we use in acute allergic reactions, all right? So when I have that acute uh, vaccine reaction or I want to pre-treat, I'm going to use Benadryl, okay? All right, now, um, there are a variety of others. One of the problems with Benadryl is it doesn't last that long, okay? Um, believe it or not, no one has ever done the pharmacokinetics of Benadryl in the dog or cat. We don't really know, but clinically, it's at least a TIA drug three times a day, if not a four times a day drug, all right? So, yeah, it helps in the immediate, but when you talk about dermatitis, how many owners are willing to give a, a, a capsule three times a day or, heaven forbid, four times a day? They won't do it. All right, they may mean to, 
But most of the problems, Benadryl is not working that well for allergic dermatitis, probably because of compliance problems. The owners just won't remember to get it in the dog frequently enough. So uh, we use other antihistamines. The one I like is Zyrtec um, and uh, another one, chlorpheniramine. Hydroxazine is actually related to Zyrtec. Actually, Zyrtec is the active metabolite of hydroxazine, so you can use either. But uh, hydroxazine is usually a TID. Uh, I can get away with BID on Zyrtec, so that's one of the ones I'll use. Chlorpheniramine. Um, is another one, old one that has been used. <laughs> now, these are just some of my, my personal preferences when I did community practice. I did a lot of these. And you'll see some individual reactions in terms of benefit. So what is not uncommon to do, especially in referral dermatology, is to have the owner start a log book of how pruritic they are and put them on two week courses of different antihistamines. And then, so, and they'll go through like five different antihistamines. And then they look at that log book and try to pick the one that seemed to benefit that animal the most. Okay, and I think the biggest thing is to get uh, one that has a fairly long action so compliance is, is reasonable. Uh, common properties, uh, they tend to have mild anticholinergic activity. We really don't see this in our animals that we recognize, but if you've taken antihistamines, you probably have gotten a dry mouth. Uh, that's from the anticholinergic, same thing. Urinary retention can be a problem in, in men uh, with anti antihistamines. I want to particularly point out injectable products. Uh, Benadryl comes orally and as an injection, and the large animal is, as far as I know, only injectable, triple enamine. There are a couple of different brand names out there, Recover and some others. Okay, I'll use the injectable Benadryl when I need a rapid onset. So uh, if, if the animal is having a type 1 vaccine reaction, I'll give it I am Benadryl. The I am is the key thing. All right, there's really this odd paradox between uh, um, rapid absorption and slow absorption. Slow is in normal. Uh, slow absorption, you give it orally, hopefully you give it I am, it's slow enough. What happens? You get sleepy. All right, most of your over-the-counter sleep aids are antihistamines. All right. So sleepiness, mild sedation is a common thing. We don't see it that much in our animals. Occasionally I see some drowsiness in, with Benadryl that owners will report. But where I've seen that, that's been more where clinicians have tried to up the dose of BID Benadryl to make it last longer that we see the sedation. I would never rely on a diphenhydramine as a sedative in the dog, say. Uh, we have better drugs. But what you don't want to do is give it IV, because this is the paradox. They actually have a profound brain stimulation from IV antihistamines. Uh, they really develop odd behaviors, they may even seizure uh, from it. <clears throat> so uh, we avoid IV antihistamines. All right. Uh, try to give them orally or I am, okay? Now, relative to the sedation, we categorize antihistamines into either first or second generation. <clears throat> the Benadryl, chlorpheniramine, hydroxazine are all first generation. Most of what we use are. And they cross the blood-brain barrier and therefore you get the sleepiness sedation. Uh, Zyrtec, Allegra, uh, Claritin, all those are second generation and they don't cross the blood-brain barrier so we don't see sedation. 
So that's a big benefit in human medicine is, and why so many second generations are used. Less of an issue in, uh, in veterinary medicine as far as I'm concerned. By the way, just personally you adapt to this. I was the same way. I'd take a Benadryl when I was a teenager and I'd be like gorked for, for you know, four hours sleeping. Now I, I could take them at bedtime and, and, and it doesn't help me. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of resistant to them.